A world remade according to a villain's whims. Ripped from the natural cycle of life and reborn into a new reality. The planet injured, fractured, with endless, never-ending suffering. All to bolster the power of a would-be god. A being so malevolent he would take the place of the life stream itself. Subverting the will of not only the planet, but all those whose spirit it contains. Channeling the ability of a long, dormant power. Manipulating past, present, and future realities. He has remade the world. And he's looking to be reborn as a god. The fate of the planet lies with a select few who would defy destiny. But how can they repair what has been broken? How can the world be restored? In this final episode, we look at a series of ideas from Jewish mysticism, examining the bonds of friendship, the suspension of the afterlife, and the restoration of the world as we ask these exact questions. So this is it, the final episode of the Final Fantasy VII Lecture Series. Let's mosey. There are a lot of lenses that help us think about the plot of Final Fantasy VII, and in this series we've already looked at concepts of predestination and thin places, but in this episode we look at perhaps the most compelling lens yet. Even since the original game, people have followed the etymology of Sephiroth's name to digest this game's story. So, to better understand what could happen in the games in the future, let's look at where this iconic villain's name comes from, a form of Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a deeply complex form of Jewish mysticism that helps explain everything from creation to a person's consciousness to humanity's task as the image bearers of God. You're the spitting image of her now. Kabbalah is first and foremost a way of understanding God and creation. Any type of creation, but especially the Genesis accounts in Hebrew scripture. While the Genesis accounts seem pretty straightforward, Kabbalah seeks to explain the hidden divine nature of that creation. Kabbalists say that the biblical Genesis creation story comes from three specific events. The Zimzum, or self-limiting of God. The Shavira, or breaking of the vessels. And the Tikkun or harmonious correction and mending of the flaw which came into the world through the breaking. Let's go through each briefly. According to Kabbalists, in the beginning there was God, or Ein Sof, which in Hebrew means infinite mystery or the source of all things. That is, he's the ultimate one, unseen and unknowable. The creation of the world demanded that this infinitely powerful God invoked self-limitations to both exist in the temporal plane and to allow for free will. To put it simply, our world then is a sacred space, which to be as human as divinely possible and as divine as humanly possible. It's a space to err, to fall, to believe, to doubt, to cry, to laugh. Our space created by the simple motion of stepping back, the humble act of honoring the separate reality of another. After creating space, God begins the process of breaking himself into limited parts. Here's how Professor Howard Schwartz says it. When God decided to bring this world into being to make room for creation, he first drew in his breath, contracting himself. And from that contraction, darkness was created. And when God said, let there be light, the light that came into being filled the darkness and 10 holy vessels came forth, each filled with primordial light. Now think of this like breaking God down into components or elements, like a water molecule being broken down into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Anyway, God sent forth these ten vessels, like a fleet of ships, each carrying its cargo of light. Had they all arrived intact, the world would have been perfect, but the vessels were too fragile to contain such a powerful divine light. And so they broke. These ten vessels, by the way, are called sephirot, and correspond with ten divine attributes or emanations that God reveals in our world. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Well, the vessels broke, they split asunder, and all the holy sparks were scattered like sand, or seeds, or like stars. These sparks fell everywhere. 
Now, in the wake of this event, most of the light that had been contained in the vessels returned to their divine source, while the remainder fell below into the empty space and attached themselves to the now broken shards of vessels. From these shards of broken vessels, the powers of what's called kelepet, or husks or shards, were produced. Basically, this is the creation of evil. Now, in addition to constituting the source of evil, the broken shards are also the basis for the material world. The sparks of light that failed to return to their source above remained trapped, as it were, among these husks. These husks, in turn, are constantly nourished and they're strengthened by the holy sparks attached to them. Indeed, if it weren't for these sparks, well, these husks, this evil, would lose their life and power altogether. So in this way, evil survives only because it's a parasite on the disconnected spark of divinity. Make sense? This disconnection of the light is the mission of creation, to rejoin the light to itself in time and in eternity. I love this phrase, that is why we were created, to gather the sparks no matter where they are hidden. God created the world so that the descendants of Jacob could raise up the holy sparks, they say. And when enough holy sparks have been gathered, the broken vessels will be restored. This is the Tikkun Olam. The repair of the world, awaited so long, will finally be complete. Therefore, it should be the aim of every person to raise these sparks from wherever they are imprisoned and to elevate them to holiness by the power of their soul. This final idea of restoring the world is compelling even to other fields of study. So much so that Carl Jung once said, the remarkable idea is developed that man is destined to become God's helper in an attempt to restore the vessels which were broken when God thought to create a world. Here the thought emerges for the first time that man must help God to repair the damage wrought by creation. For the first time, man's cosmic responsibility is acknowledged. Now I share all this because I want you to see what's happening in the live stream and during Final Fantasy VII Remake in light of all this. The Whispers, as we discussed in the first lecture, are agents of the live stream, but they seem to be acting erratically, even to Aerith, as though their very existence is in danger. Could it be that they are being infected by a parasite, like the Kelepet that we just talked about? Then at the end, the life stream, similar to the mysterious source, the Ein Sof, is fragmented, fractured, and torn to some degree by the elimination and defeat of the Whispers. And what immediately happens? Shards of light fall onto a seemingly infant creation that is different. Light shards explode and they fall on Zack. They reawaken Biggs. Now is this meant to be akin to the creation or recreation of a new world? An illusory world where things aren't exactly what they seem? But a bigger question may be, why Zack and Biggs? And even more than that, why do Cloud and specific others in the story seem to have such importance to Sephiroth that they can see the whispers and defy fate to some degree? Ultimately, through the lens of Kabbalah, because these are all vessels with a shred of divine light that can alter the course of destiny, they are vessels of the life stream, bearing specific components of the divine serving as a perfect potential vessel for Sephiroth to absorb and potentially command. Many of these Sephiroth attributes correspond to key character motivations in the game, and yet Sephiroth seems to want to subvert or change those motivations. Like I mentioned earlier, repairing the world demands a rebirth and rejoining of all ten of these Sephirothic attributes, which is why Cloud's seemingly fractured psyche is so important to Sephiroth. He is the broken husk that Sephiroth wishes to join. Now this is wildly heady stuff, I know, but stick with me. I think there's at least some level of influence taken from these mystical metaphors, especially when you look at the individual attributes represented in the Vessels of Light, the Sephiroth themselves. Now let's look at each, and as we do, let's consider which characters they may correspond to within Final Fantasy VII Remake, and why Sephiroth from the game wants to control them. To simplify this next part, Kabbalah offers a framing guide to understand the ten attributes of Ein Sof, or God, called the Tree of Life. It's a process of creation at the top to the manifestation of that creation at the bottom. Let's go through each one. 
Starting at the top, we have Keter, which means crown. Though it shouldn't really be thought of as king or royalty or anything like that. Instead, this is the initiation point of will or desire for creation. You might refer to a conscious preference or providence. Though the tree of life and the sphera are repeated endlessly, at the topmost part of the greatest one, I would place the providence of the divine. In this case, the life stream, as all the sphera flow from it. Knowing all things, having intention for all things, this is the origination point for regulating all things. And this is the exact point that Sephiroth wants to take for himself. So keep that in mind. Now this is the beginning point for what will emerge at the bottom, which will be the recipient of all these attributes. That's the product of creation called the Malkit. In Final Fantasy VII, the Malkit could be any number of things, but I would argue that two Malkit parallels of interest would be both Cloud and the planet or the world itself. Now it's important to think of these two entities as we go through this because these are what's at stake. Cloud and the planet are being ripped apart and being remade in a lot of ways. So with that, let's return to the top. Below Keter, we have Hakma and Dina. These are two necessary ways of looking at the mind of the higher faculties. Hakma is the associative right brain of the divine, the wisdom, if you will. And in Final Fantasy VII, it is related to the life stream that works to bring association to all things. Bina, meanwhile, is the analytical decisive mind. It's the left brain, the understanding characteristic of the divine. This is the decision maker. And Bina directs wisdom into practical knowledge. Now think of both of these as the Setra or the Ancients. They contain both wisdom and understanding of the planet and are typically hidden from the temporal realm, just like the hidden attributes of the divine are. Now these two come together into a blueprint called the Dot, or knowledge. Wisdom and understanding merge to form a sort of practical blueprint. The best example in Final Fantasy VII are the various groups that exist in the game. Avalanche is a dot. Shinra is a dot. The Shinobi, the Gi, all of these groups offer an ideological blueprint for how they will exist in the world based on their interpretation of the wisdom of the ancients. Next we have the extremes of Chesed and Gevura. Oftentimes referred to as untamed kindness and limiting strength, a simpler understanding could be flow and limits. Hesed is the unbound flow of the creative process. It's freeform, like an ocean. Boundless compassion or kindness, for example, or unrestrained enthusiasm, infinite ideation. This is a very affecting state, for both good and for destruction. Gevura, by contrast, is the limits, or the boundaries placed on that flow. It's restraint of the compassion, tempering the boundless. Think of the boundless enthusiasm and energy of, say, Yuffie in the game, and how that's tempered by Barrett, for example. That's a great dichotomy to think of here. Now, if we travel down to the bottom of the tree, we have more polarities that directly impact the final result, the Malkit. Stemming from Gevura's strength and limit, we have focus, or Hod. This is a goal-oriented laser focus on the end goal. This emanation is often referred to as glory or majesty. It's the finish line, it's the acclaim. Now, several characters do embody this as well. Think Rufus or Hojo with their respective goals, even Leslie with his fiance, Vincent with his ambition toward Hojo and Sephiroth, or even Red or Nanaki with his father, even. These are all goal-oriented attributes that exist within these particular characters. Now, this next one is really interesting. With it, we have the attribute of endurance or perseverance. It's the unyielding hesed or flow. It embodies the refusal to give up, the refusal to end. And it appropriately is called netzach. Netzach implies two Hebrew words, nitzahon, which is victory over our fears, and nitzkit, which is eternity. This combines into a common name, Zachariah or Zachary, which means God remembers. Now this absolutely corresponds with the similarly named Zach Fair, whose legacy and importance to both Cloud and the live stream endures beyond his life, right? Now here's where it gets really interesting. In between these extremes of severity on one side and mercy on the other is a central sephirot for beauty sometimes called balance or harmony. Now this emanation of the divine is the perfect combination between limit and flow, and is considered the central necessary characteristic for creation and restoration of whatever has been lost. Are you ready? It's called Tiferet, or Tifereth, or Tiferes. 
Pretty interesting, right? It's the embodiment of beauty and compromise, and I do not think it is coincidental that Tifa and Aerith are the two core elements for bringing Tikkun-style restoration of the broken in Final Fantasy VII, but we'll get back to that. Tiferis determines how much severity or mercy will manifest in the resulting object of creation, and that is the Yesod, or the translation point, it's the foundation, which will then be poured into the Malkant, or the manifestation at the bottom. With the defeat of the Whispers, Sephiroth stands poised to reign at the top of creation's order, ruling alongside Genova to manipulate all these emanations to influence and remake both the planet and cloud. And just like in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the rejoining and self-actualizing of these various characters is the key to restoring everything. And for that, we need to focus more on that center of the tree, Teferis, or the roles of Tifa and Aerith. In the remake trilogy, affinity or relationship bonds are significant for Cloud, which makes sense in that each person to some degree will restore Cloud to his full self. However, Tifa and Aerith are perhaps the most integral characters to his full restoration, and even more than that, the restoration of the planet. For Aerith, this is obvious. She knows more than any other character the depth of disrepair that both the planet and Cloud are in. It's part of her role of being a listener to the planet. Yet, if we follow the original game, she must choose between saving Cloud and the planet. She does what she can for Cloud, but must eventually go to do what only she can do. As a Cetra, she has a unique relationship with the planet. She hears its voice, and her heart breaks over its cry. And when Sephiroth's threat grows to critical levels, she must do what only she can. She embodies the eternal flow, the Hesed in this case. Her role is bigger than just Cloud, but it includes him. Like she says, This isn't about me, though. It's about saving the world. And you. Meanwhile, I think Aerith is counting on Tifa to save Cloud. Throughout the original game, Tifa's role is much more focused on Cloud's well-being than the fate of the world, embodying the strength and focus on him that Aerith simply isn't able to have. Even as children, Tifa had concern for Cloud, though Cloud promised to be there when she was in need. When we're older, and you're a famous soldier, if I'm ever trapped or in trouble, promise you'll come and save me. Come on, promise me. Fine. I promise. It's a promise she's determined to keep as well, and when Cloud is at his breaking point in the original game, it's Tifa who helps him reclaim himself. Just as Teferis holds the Kabbalah Tree of Life in beauty and balance, so do its corresponding characters hold the world of Final Fantasy VII in harmony. Aerith and Tifa both play critical roles in restoring that which was broken, which is why Sephiroth seeks to disrupt their relationships with Cloud. They say she's a monster, that she can peer inside you, into the very depths of your soul, that she can become those you hate, those you fear, Cloud and Tifa have a shared history from childhood. Their bond is near unbreakable. Yet Sephiroth, through Genova's power, reinvents and distorts their bond by remaking the past, through illusory worlds and hallucinations, making them question what is fact or fiction. Even from the original game, his recounting of what happens in Nibelheim makes Tifa suspicious of him. She doesn't fully trust him, even though she longs to. As Cloud's grip on reality weakens, he will become more and more vulnerable to Sephiroth's manipulation. It'll cause him to act erratically, even turning on those he can trust. Those we hate, those we love, those we fear. Genova would become anyone to fool her prey. Don't do this! But I'm no fool. Tifa's guard will be up. This isn't just a relationship dynamic, this is Sephiroth intervening to stop Tifa from bringing balance and beauty to Cloud. Her mission will be to employ strength through severity, Gavura, Hode, an understanding to restore Cloud. You gotta be better than this, if you're gonna play the hero. She's constantly there for him. By turning Cloud and Tifa on one another, however, Sephiroth may split apart the one thing that saves Cloud. However, for the fate of the planet, Sephiroth must also turn his sword against another. 
Similar to Tifa, Aerith has helped to bring levity and a spirited energy to Cloud, but her goal is much broader. As things grow more dire, Aerith must take on the full mantle of the role of Cetra. Therefore, she prays for the planet's help, igniting the power of the white materia she holds. However, when she's struck down by Sephiroth, she will return to the planet Stasis, like I mentioned last episode. There, I believe she'll seek to bring mercy and calm to the life stream, journeying alongside those who have already been lost, into the promised land of the Cetra, discerning their secrets, as she inevitably takes on Genova, the parasite that seeks to vanquish life light in these husks of the world, the cause of the near extinction of her ancestors within the static life stream, restoring the proper cycle and flow to the planet, which has always been the face off that I personally want to see. Aerith, along with the power of the Cetra, finally bringing Genova to justice. How cool is that? Even so, there's danger within that static life stream. When Aerith inevitably wakes up in Zack's world, that's when Sephiroth's full endgame is set into motion. His goal is not only to kill her in the real world and bring her into the life stream, but because of her abilities, he's going to need to kill her in the life stream as well, removing her from the equation altogether. Listen to this phrase from Marlene. Promise not to tell? When she wakes up, a scary man is going to kill her. She will be working against Sephiroth to restore balance to the chaos Sephiroth has wrought to the cycle of the planet. And if she can't, even if Cloud is able to defeat Sephiroth, Sephiroth will simply emerge again from the live stream once again, using the unending cycle of the planet to his advantage. But that was then, and this is now. So moving on from Remake, you have two things at stake. Tifa saving Cloud, Aerith saving the planet. And Sephiroth will fight both sides of this, but it's even bigger than this. Every character that can defy destiny is his concern, so he will stop at nothing to take each one of them down one by one. Because each contributes to some attribute of Cloud's rehabilitation, this is how he will break Cloud, inflicting pain, distorting memory, calling everything about Cloud's identity into question because he cannot win against a fully formed, self-actualized Cloud. Likewise, he must be vanquished within the life stream itself since he will simply be reborn again and again as he evades absorption into its flow. Whether by his own insistence or Genova's power, he's done it before and he will do it again and again. So in order to fully vanquish Sephiroth once and for all, he must be eliminated on both fronts, in time and in eternity. Which brings us to the central conflict that many have. Many ask if a remake is a sequel or a full reimagining of the original. Well, here I'd like to explain that I'm of the mindset that Final Fantasy VII Remake doesn't have to be a sequel. Instead, like every Final Fantasy before it, it's a cycle. In the first video I ever made, I said that the core element that makes a Final Fantasy story uniquely Final Fantasy is breaking the cycle, be it a cycle of oppression or kingship or something else. But in Final Fantasy VII, it's always been about breaking and restoring the natural cycle of the planet, and in Remake, this is exactly what's happening again. Seven tells the story of how a party who defies destiny confronts a villain who manipulates the reincarnational cycle of the planet for his own ends. A cycle that was alluded to in the original but is fully explained in Remake. A cycle that would neither nullify nor necessitate inclusion of the original game, but nonetheless, a cycle that has continued repeatedly. A cycle of existence that Sephiroth has manipulated before and will simply keep manipulating unless Aerith and Zack's party and Cloud and Tifa's party break the cycle once and for all. Well, there you have it. The Final Fantasy VII Lecture Series comes to an end for now. And yet, I feel like there's still so much more to consider. And with Rebirth and a third installment on the way, we're bound to have more questions soon. Those, however, will be questions and conversations for the future. But for now, we draw this lecture series to a close. And on a personal note, let me simply say this. It has been an honor to share these lenses with you. Thank you so much for watching, for participating in both these videos and the long form lecture plays. I don't take for granted that you have spent time watching this content. So thank you. And I look forward to our next journey together. Remember to like and subscribe. And until next time, walk tall, my friends.